Hello, welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure to, uh, um, to welcome all of you to the uh, joint plenary organized by the executive and the scientific committee. And in organizing this uh, plenary, we thought that uh, we would like to address the team of the conference from the perspective of anthropological knowledge production and its entanglements with the narratives, regimes, and governance of mobility. And in doing that, the plenary aims to explore the concepts such as mobility, uh, displacement, and of uh, displacement of people, goods, and circulation of knowledge, and, and how they are debated in different parts of the world, the genealogies of those concepts. So in a way, we try to uh, decenter the knowledge production about the theme of the conference. And uh, we were very happy to have uh, uh, three distinguished speakers about the topic, and uh, Nina neuborg Sorensen. Christiana Bastos and Bella Feldman uh, Bianco. And this would be the order of our speakers. Let me first introduce Nina very briefly. Nina Sorensen is the head of the migration department at the Danish Institute for International Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Her work focuses on multiple forms of migration and topics on transnational processes as well as commercialization and management of migration, migration industries, it's a uh, crossroads with the security industries, that uh, many of the panels also address these questions. In fact, the three speakers' uh, topics that the talks are uh, are very much in conversation with many of the uh, many of the panels, and hopefully they will be from uh, providing a kind of a uh, broadening of those uh, uh, debates. And uh, Nina Sorensen's work uh, in regionally focused in Latin America, and she had worked on Dominican Republic, Honduras, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, and Me Mexico, and of course, Somaliland in Africa and also her uh, work focused on the uh, conflict management and migration development and migration security ne uh, nexus. And she's also known with her uh, interventions with policy papers in those areas. So it is also to remind us the importance of public anthropology and the role of anthropologists in, uh, in, the, in policy making processes. So please allow me to welcome Nina Sorensen for her talk. I think we agreed uh, to stay as a round table. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I have really been looking forward to be among so many anthropologists as I work in a multidisciplinary um, environment on a daily basis. You can see that I have slightly changed the title to Human Mobility in Times of Crisis and the Usefulness of Trespassing Concepts. A basic premise in anthropology is that both space and movement are socially constituted and that the bodily movement of individuals therefore involves relations of power. The tendency among anthropologists to approach mobility from the perspective of the mobile subject who acts, adapts and sometimes circumvents barriers to movement has prompted questions of whether and how to differentiate mobilities, for example, according to periodic, cyclical, or more permanent mobility patterns, and with the transnational turn 
to questions of uh, connectivity and multiple belongings. Over the years, anthropologists have criticized the mobile sedentary divide inherent in conventional migration studies and increasingly also the tendency to pose mobility as potentially hostile to settled populations. Anthropologists, together with other critical social scientists, have been at the forefront of pointing out how alarmist crisis narratives on mass displacement produce migrant illegality and deportability uh, and further frame mobile populations with national security or humanitarian agendas, thereby relegating the people in question to someone to be either feared or protected. Both narratives serve migration control functions. Questions, um, uh, in, in questions related to the thousands of migrants and refugees currently drawn, draw, drawing at sea or dying along overland migration trails, anthropologists have engaged with how humanitarian, military and security interventions converge and how this not merely is because the rescue of migrants is operated by the same military that are also deployed to screen movements, fight smugglers and deter further departures, but also as coined by uh, Nicolas de Genova, because the humanitarian and military responses are part of the same narrative framing of mobile populations. This framing jumbled together, and I quote, scenes of death, rescue and capture in particular border spectacles, unquote. In the following, I wish to reflect on issues of mobility in times defined uh, as crisis. I use my ethnographic research on Guatemalan mobilities um, uh, as ex exemplification, and I propose three arguments. Uh, first, following Parr and Pfeiffer's call for a conceptual reassessment of disruptive human mobilities, I use the tangled histories of war and post-conflict Guatemalan migration to point out the importance of exceeding politically defined categories, such as migrant or refugee, for analytical purposes. Second, my presentation invites to consider the issue of forced disappearance when regimes make people disappear in different historical contexts. This latter issue uh, forms part of comparative work I currently uh, uh, engage in with Professor Lara Hutunen at Tampere University, but she's not responsible for my words today. The relationship between armed conflict, pre- and post-war inequality and insecurity and human mobility is complex and complicated by the fact that neither are monolithic uh, phenomena. Armed conflict, whether within or between states, produce migration as well as containment and what Stephen uh, Lubkeman has called involuntary immobility. Post-war political economies produce sustained pressures to migrate that often divide families between different countries and produce the physical absence of relatives <coughs> that again may invoke memories of wartime losses. Apart from being a mere economic option, international mobility may become, uh, and here I quote uh, McAllister and Nelson, the social project of a post-war generation, a project that in times of enhanced border control may demand as much ingenuity as joining a revolutionary movement must have required in earlier generations, unquote. So how far those mobilized by war or dispossession become internally displaced, involuntarily immobile, disappear along their trajectories uh, <coughs> or make it to foreign destinations from where they eventually may return or be deported, um, depends more on the global migration regime than on the reasons people may have for mobilizing their uh, existence. A third argument I would like to convey is that the construction of particular mobility narratives as crisis provides fertile ground for critical reflection on human mobility and immobility according to the degree of force 
circumscribing particular experiences. And along the way then, I introduced trespassing as an analytical category. But let me first say a few words about crisis. The Merriam-Webster dictionary defines a crisis as an unstable or crucial time of state of affairs in which a deci decisive change is impending, one with a distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. Crisis, the Oxford English Dictionary adds, is moreover a time of intense difficulty and danger during which difficult or important decisions must be made. A crisis then involves a turning point that might lead um, to either recovery or catastrophe and is as such understood as temporary. But as uh, Danish anthropologist Henrik V has argued, for a great number of people, crises are endemic rather than episodic. War may turn into an aftermath or post-conflict situation without altering the social inequalities that led uh, to the war in the first place. For those struggling to make ends meet by migrating without permission, a sense of crisis uh, may become a chronic and constant condition, not a decisive moment of opportunity. So crisis is a central concept in migration research. Scholars and often the migrants themselves explain migration as reacting, uh, reaction to crisis. Generally, crises have tended to be thought of in economic terms in conventional migration, labor migration studies, whereas forced migration and refugee studies have emphasized the political and security aspects of crisis situations. However, economic and political factors are not easily disentangled uh, when trying to understand present-day migration trajectories in Central America. Rather, what emerges is a complex mobility system consisting of internal, regional and international uh, migrations mobilized by shifting structural conditions over time. Simultaneously, different trajectories tend to converge and coexist according to the relationship uh, between economic and political instabilities in the countries of origin, transit and destination. Meanwhile, uh, irregularity together with references to alarming numbers or chaotic forms of arrival habitually develop into crisis. This happened in 2010 and again in 11, when mass graves containing the bodies of hundreds of mainly Central American migrants were discovered in the north of Mexico, in Taumalipas. And it happened again in 2014, when an unprecedented number of Central American children and young people crossed the Mexican-US border just as the race for the US presidential elections were beginning. Staging uh, irregular migration in general and child migration in particular uh, as a migration tr crisis, Trump declared his war on migration. The war and its solution um, envisaged in this beautiful wall uh, should be seen as the culmination of stricter and increasingly militarized border enforcement policies. However, framing migration as crisis without regard to its underlying violent realities has resulted in a reshuffling of meanings uh, of irregular, undocumented or unauthorized migration, which is now to be thought of as illegal, criminal and a risk to national identity and security. When such, and I will call it discursive trespassing, is made, mobility ceases to be understood as a reaction to crisis and become the crisis in itself. However, from the perspective of Central American migrants, the relationship between war and migration emerges in different forms and evokes different memories in those affected. Some compare the risk of fleeing armed conflicts to the risks encountered along the migration trail, while others draw parallels between forced displacement and deportation. To the extent that historical experiences of political violence and its consequences continue to inform contemporary migration experiences, the legal violence encountered upon arrival is also compared to um, the violence suffered 
during the armed conflicts at the place of origin. Some migrants um, that I've talked to may experience similarities uh, between the mil militarization of, of life in Central America and the immigration enforcement strategies in the United States, while others find parallels between the forced disappearance of the politically targeted during Latin, Americans, uh, Latin America's dirty wars and deportation from uh, the United States. For Central American children who migrated with their parents and who for various reasons continue to live in tenuous legality, being exiled home, that is deported, and having to go through yet another displacement trauma spells crisis in capital letters. So does the risk of being disappeared along the routes. The category of, of forced disappearance was first developed in relationship to practices carried out during these um, 30 wars and other uh, dictatorships in the region. Um, and it is associated with state-sponsored practices of abducting persons considered subversives and involves the arrest, detention, and other forms of deprivation of freedom, followed by a refusal to acknowledge these acts and concealment of the fate of the disappeared person, and by consequence denying that person <coughs> recourse to legal remedies um, and protection by the law. So, and, and for this place, uh, forced disappearance is not only a question of getting rid of unwanted persons. It is intended as a warning to the family and the community of the disappeared and as such serves preventive purposes. Don't tell, oh, don't challenge the regime, you may disappear, or don't challenge migration law, you may disappear. And the latter statement has become the common trope in warm warning campaigns serving externalized border control purposes. Global concern for missing people is predominantly cast as responses to war, armed conflict, terrorism, or natural disasters. And when involving migrants um, to trafficking and is then framed largely, largely in terms of right to know legislation. So family members have the right to know wh whether their relative is alive or dead. But as the significance of forced disappearance lies in, its, in the power it has to induce collective anguish and ca that can be exploited for social and political ends, my interest in analytically trespassing the limits of the political history and application of the concept stems from the observation that both war and migration situations seem to involve disciplinary effects and the disappearance of people. Over 200,000 people were killed, at least half a million fled Guatemala um, during the, the 36 years long armed conflict, whereas in between 40,000 and 50,000 were forcibly uh, disappeared by the regime. So these are high numbers. During this time, Guatemalan state officials turned to the perverse logic of claiming that many of the disappeared had in fact lived for the United States as economic migrants without telling their families. They thereby turned the perception of the refugee as a person betraying her country by leaving to that of a migrant betraying her family by not telling she was leaving. The logic behind this reasoning somewhat resembles the tendency within migration governance and to some extent migration studies to rank migrants along a continuum of choice, a uh, continuum Sharam uh, Khosravi describes as ranging from free, voluntary and thus proactive migration uh, to unfree, forced and thus reactive migration in response to living situations encompassing various aspects of threat at the other end and only the latter deserves a humanitarian response. Since the war ended in 1996, over a million Guatemalans have embarked on international migration, now not as refugees, but as migrants, according to legal categories. Two thirds remain in irregular, irregularized situations, <coughs> um, and post-conflict migration took off simultaneously with stricter US um, border enforcement that led to um, 
spatially dispersal of, of, of entry attempts, uh, rechanneling of migration path into remote and treacherous areas, and a significant increase in the costs and risks asso associated with border crossing. And given that this prevention through deterrent strategy explicitly is used to demonstrate that migrants traveling without permission may find themselves in mortal danger, it is violence, not security ob objectives, that guide this for the current uh, border regime. Over the years, thousands of Guatemalans have disappeared during migration attempts. Today, state officials on both sides of the border habitually attribute the disappearance of irregularized migrants to human traffickers or organized criminal networks. And in both th of these accounts, uh, disappearances seem to attach naturally either to the migrant or the human smuggler, downplaying the consequences of state policies. And these consequences are readily identified uh, among migrants, um, however, not least among those having experienced deportation. Back then, the Guatemalan army disappeared peop uh, people and elderly migrant uh, deported from Postville, Iowa, told me in 2012. Today, people disappear along the migrant trail, he continued, La Migra, and the US police have become the new authority. Before the finding of migrant containing um, mass graves uh, in Mexico, the Guatemalan state did not keep records of disappeared migrants. During 2011, however, approximately 100 Guatemalans reported the disappearance of a migrant relative <coughs> to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Human Rights Ombudsman's uh, Office. Others organized and established uh, regional al alliances such as the Central American Migration Movement and uh, the Central American Mothers Movement, who embark on yearly search caravans throughout Mexico. And they use the powerful symbol of missing persons developed during the war and make themselves publicly visible with a picture of their disappeared migrant relative attached to their chest. You all know that figure. <coughs> while demanding, alive you took them, alive we want them back. And this is a central political claim of these organizations, that current migration from the region cannot be considered irregular labor migration, but must be seen as forced displacement of people fleeing extreme violence and imminent risks of death. Uh, conducted by criminal structures uh, in the countries of origin and transits in which state officials are implicated. Evidence produced by international organizations such as Médecins Sans Frontières confirms that current migration from Central America is embedded in a much broader security crisis in which people are running for their lives. Partly in response to declining donor funding, partly in response to demand, uh, the Guatemalan Forensic Association, FAFRE, whose tireless anthropologists have exhumed um, clandestine uh, grave sites and helped identify the forcibly disappeared during the violent conflict, these anthropologists have lately di diversified their work to also include um, uh, migrant disappearances. They offer to take DNA samples from family members that later can be matched with unidentif unidentified bodies found in mass graves uh, or morgues in Mexico and beyond. Call <coughs> 1598, a radio and television campaign, encourages with DNA, Favre identifies the disappeared. As a Liva example, or as a Liva sample from a family member is enough, please remember to give a sample before you travel through Mexico. The strong legacy of framing disappearance as forced feeds into, uh, feeds into understanding migrant disappearances through such practices. However, since the Guatemalan state's provision of justice to the war victims of forced disappearance um, is still an open battlefield, the recent practice of including migrant disappearances in the work against forced disappearance 
has received mixed reactions from the wider group of war victim organizations that the Forensic Anthropologist Network and work with. Some are worried uh, that joining forces with victims of contemporary disappearances could weaken the cause of the many still unresolved wartime cases. Hotliners find the wartime disappearances of revolutionaries somewhat more honorable than the disappearance of poor migrants and strongly guard the category from trespassing. During a recent field work, uh, a leading activist um, uh, said, who would even think about um, such a thing, como les ocurre, um, when I asked if she could see potential in joining forces with migrant mothers. By way of conclusion, let me sum up uh, by saying a few words about trespassing. To commit a trespass is usually taken to mean entering unlawfully upon the premises of another to make an uninvited incursion. This is exactly the definition used to legi legitimize border control. When used as a transitive verb, trespassing also indicates a violation of good manners, or in a broader sense, a violation of the right to inhabit a certain category. The struggle between wartime, wartime victims and migrant associations around who has the right to be defined as forcibly disappeared is an example of this. However, by insisting on calling the disappearance of migrants forced and by pointing to the involvement of state actors in such acts <coughs> uh, of disappearance, migrant activist groups are preparing the ground for converting the notion of migration crisis from a question of unwanted flows in need of military responses to a human crisis produced exactly by the militarization of the global migration regime. Further, the juxtaposition of forced disappearance in two seemingly disparate situations, first the missing persons, and this is important, who are nationals produced during instances of armed conflict, and second, uh, the missing migrants and refugees who, through the illegalization, remain non-nationals. Um, and, and this is often occurring uh, in direct consequence of increasing obstacles put on human mobility. I think this enables a conceptual move uh, from the national to the transnational um, arena uh, of this term of forced um, um, displacement, no, for forced disappearances, of course. And such moves indicate, I will say, the value of conceptual trespassing and trespassing as ethnographic practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina, for this excellent talk and uh, giving us from a perspective from the forced disappearances and then the entanglements with the war victims and about the irregularity. Now we move to, we give the uh, floor to Christiana Bastos and Christiana Bastos is a professor at the University of Lisbon Institute of Social Sciences. Her work is anchored at the crossroads of anthropology, history and social studies of science focusing on migration colonialism, medicine, empire, and social history of health in Brazil, the United States, and colonial Goa and Lusophone Africa. Currently, Bostos is working on an ERC project titled The Color of Labor, The Racialized Lives of Migrants that focuses on the racialization of migrant laborers, laborers across political boundaries in the late 19th and 20th century. Uh, in uh, Guyanese, Caribbean, and Hawaiian sugar plantations, and in New England cotton mills. And I gather that the talk is also based partly on that project on the okay. sugar plantations. Christiana, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha, uh, Sarah Green, uh, Martin, and Miguel for inviting me for this uh, wonderful session, which fits perfectly for my explorations on labor-related mobilities and the cultural production that goes with it. Forgive me for the preliminary character of some of my analysis and I'll be absolutely happy to 
receive all the criticisms you can think of. The presentation will have two sessions. Two, two sections. In the first, I will respect what I said in the uh, abstract, uh, which was uh, extracted in uh, some special conditions. And in the second, I will go on into one uh, case study, which uh, Aisha uh, suggested me that would be uh, a little better than the entire world I promised in the abstract. Let's go to the color of labor. Oh. And allow me a very brief moment of self-referencing with uh, two articles that, okay, that represent two moments of this journey uh, of conceptual development. Uh, the uh, 2008 uh, migrant settlers and colonies is kind of where it all started, and the 2018, which also starts with the word migrants, uh, is uh, the first uh, delivery of uh, this uh, journey. Um, so in the 2008 article, I was looking after what I thought then and what is presented as a colonial settlement. It uh, meant that a few hundred uh, Madeiran Islanders had been moved, sponsored as settlers to the southern plateau of Angola, and uh, they were depicted as colonial pioneers. Make a long story short, I argued that more, or at least as much, but uh, probably more important than looking at this as a colonial act, one should look at it in the context of a global competition for laboring bodies. This was in 1885. It was a moment of the European scramble for Africa, but it was also a very intense moment of uh, moving, attracting, displacing, and trafficking bodies across the world. So that's what led me into developing this concept. Uh, once the traffic in enslaved African bodies was outlawed in the 19th century, planters, human traffickers, and governments invented other schemes of bringing laboring bodies onto plantations. So there were Madeiran Islanders among them in big numbers. They went to British Guiana, to the Caribbean, and later to Hawaii. Their massive emigration was later erased from an uh, empire-obsessed Portuguese historiography and erased from most historiographies. But in the 19th century, this was a major issue of concern. And politicians uh, were trying, the Portuguese politicians were trying to reroute them into the territories administered by the nation. They tried and tried, and they didn't succeed. And then this uh, settling of uh, Angolan plateau was a kind of a two-in-one. Two now, uh, I can I analyze in that article that they epitomized the intertwinement of colonial and migration movements. Now, lacking appropriate conceptual tools to jointly study migration and empire back then in 2008, in a fractured academic scape that separates those fields and further separates empires according to nations, British, Dutch, Portuguese, French, etc., I found myself on the quest for conceptual development. I tried to use displacement and was uh, tried to use crossing boundaries, tried to go empirical. I was uh, reviewed with criticism. If you are in the room, it's okay. I moved on. Uh, <laughs> I. I got to design a truly ambitious, multi-track, multi-site, multi-period, multidisciplinary, multi-focused project around the concept, the concept, the color of labor. And uh, I address labor mobility and the production of race across distinct political units. Labor implies laborers, their bodies, their identifications, their culture production, and other anthropological themes to be investigated ethnographically in vivo and in the archives. The first outcome was, as I mentioned, the New England uh, Migrants Inequalities and Social Research in the 1920s. And also, I'm going to shorten that, uh, uh, that uh, comment just to say that it allowed me to expand into industrial settings the concept of plantation. So I'm talking of plantation at white, including industries, including uh, 
uh, post-capitalist uh, ventures and so on. And I'm doing it with a wonderful team. Uh, you were invited to check the site and see more. I can't describe it in full, but we have all these research tracks, Guyana, Y, New England, Saint Tome, and also Mauritius and Italy, and two parallel tracks on uh, things that are conceptual, mobilities and race. So now I'll move to my field, which is Hawaii. And I'll go first to the lure of sugar. And now a little chronology. By the time Hawaii became a part of the world market, sugar had long been established as king of commodities, queen of addictive taste, prince of induced atrocities. There is no shortage of accounts, chronologies, and analytical frameworks on how this product came into being, how it connected the energetic needs of the laboring classes who made the Industrial Revolution in Northern Europe, plus the endless appetite for distinction of the upper classes or their willingness to pay for a rare good and its promises of cure, redemption, and happiness. It broke the long. And at the other end of the line, the brutal world of South American and Caribbean plantations, their economy of enslavement, and the circulation of capital, people, vessels, ideas, intentions, emotions, and things it generated. Mince's Sweetness and Power is the most iconic and quoted anthropological historical tableaus of the plantation world. It has dozens of hundreds or hundreds of spin-offs that trace the connections between the consumption and production of the so-called white gold, the regimes of labor and capital that went with it, the societies, cultures, types, characters, classes and races it produced. No other commodity epitomized so powerfully the economy of enslavement and racialization processes it produced. Titles like blood sugar, sugar in the blood, bitter sugar, sovereign sugar, cost of sugar, and other books remind us of that mighty link. By the time sugar was adapted as a wise central trade good past the mid 19th century, the world had already become hostage of that commodity. The global circulation of capital and people were shaped by sugar, as well as by the commodity siblings of coffee, cocoa, cotton, rubber, and so on. Endless tons of them had already traveled either as solids or liquids, rum, cachaça, and so on, from Brazil and Caribbean into North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. Land had been carved and forests and swamps to give way to the grounds of plantations. Watercourses had been routed to water the plants of plantations. The soil had been prepared year in, year out, day in, day out, to be hooded and seeded. Canes had grown and had been tended, harvested, carried, threshed, crushed in engines, the resulting pulp and liquid boiled and boiled again, made into molasses and crystals and eventually distilled. Behind all those procedure, procedures and gestures, there were human beings, their arms, their legs, their entire bodies, their energy and their sweat, their blood. Uh, their labor was written and disciplined by force. Their existences were chained and vilified to humanity. Their collective identities merged into the bottom of an imaginary hierarchy of separate races. They had mostly been brought from Africa, fed by raids, wars, violence, trade goods. They were themselves commodified, shipped, sold, purchased, or brought to the, and brought to the plantations. Deprived of references to their previous lives and identities, dispersed and compressed into the new identity of the slave, the hand, the labor, the negro, the black, a type in a hierarchized system, a race, a place in the plantation, a name place that glued to the skin for the years and generations to come. By the time Hawaii entered the sugar economy, the world had the so-called science of races that helped supporting the inequalities of the plantation and its legacy of segregation and hierarchy. 
But that had been in the Caribbean and the Americas and had involved enslaved Africans and endangered Asians. That was the story of empire and colonialism. Hawaii had not meant to follow the same racialist plot, but it adopted sugar too, and along with sugar, it created its own dynamics of racialization, which is what I'm examining below. Some Hawaiian chronologies. Most chronologies single out 1778 as the date of juncture in Hawaiian history, what in the older Eurocentric terminology had been referred as its discovery by Captain Cook. Many anthropologists around the world can recite the debates opposing different interpretations of the Hawaiian interpretation of Cook's arrival to the islands with his crew and vessels. Was Cook taken for Lono, as one think, for his triumphal arrival at the Kealekekwa Bay during the high moment of the Makahiki festival? Was he just a mortal who met with a mortal and after <coughs> a mortal end after a cultural misunderstanding? This debate is beyond my point here. Uh, nor is it really a debate, I think, because Hawaiians were many and held different views on Cook that depended on their own position and or in the social and symbolic structure. Priests may have taken his, uh, him as God and warriors may have taken him as enemy and both coexisted in the way priestly and warrior views coexist through the world in tension and contradiction. Hawaiians were many and very different. A crucial point, however, is that there were oceanic travels much before Cook. Hawaii had a very complex society. It was not a close-knit community, and uh, uh, they had traveled from Tahiti and Marquesas and back and forth and back and forth. And what I want to single out from here is that one of the things that best epitomizes their uh, Pacific connection of that all that traveling is the plant taro. And I propose to see uh, taro as a marker and what came out after 1778 as an anti-taro race. The race involved other species, other crops, other uses of land, other foods, other rituals, other channels, other scopes, other connections, other purposes, and other social hierarchies. To make a long story short, missionaries and traders from different parts of the world came after 1778 to Hawaii, many of them from New England, bringing with them New England beliefs in piety, fortune, success, and money-making. Missionaries bred traders, they became almost indistinguishable. They were children of each other, and uh, their name, their local name was Holy the white missionaries and traders, mostly Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. The holy carved a comfortable niche for themselves in Hawaiian society and mingled and mated with local aristocracy, the Ali. The connections and things brought by the holy and their uses by the Ali introduced further complexity into the already complex local dynamics. Political unifications within the island and inter-islands were made easier with the use of guns and gunpowder. Uh, riches and privileges augmented with overseas trade. First was sandalwood and then it became sugar. And that was the most tough competitor to Taro on the agricultural landscape, in the economy, in people's bodies. <coughs> now, plantation, land, capital and labor. A sweet fertile land would not have been enough to have Hawaii adopt sugar. Hawaii was not a formal colony of any country, no playground for European sugar barons making their fortune overseas and building mansions back home. It was an indigenous kingdom ruled by a dynasty that went back to Kamehameha the Great that unified most of the archipelago before the 19th century. Land could not be privately, privately owned for business, but then again, started in 1839 and completed in 
1848, there was a land partition, the Great Mahele. It was meant to grant contract title to native Hawaiians in a Western legal sense, but it soon was transformed into its opposite. In 1850, the amendment allowed foreigners to also own land, which is an act of colonialism outside formal imperial control, as argued by Sally Ingo Mary. Next, there was a reciprocity treaty, and that made capital flows easy. Only labor was a miss. Sugar was a labor devouring endeavor. But Hawaii was not the Caribbean, nor Brazil, nor Southern United States. Hawaii entered the sugar economy when the world had already been through the horrors of enslavement and displacement as the ways of feeding labor to plantations. Most societies had by then gone through abolition or were actively fighting it. Local free labor was not an option either. There wasn't enough people. By the time the sugar economy started, Hawaiians faced annihilation and disappearance. They had been through rapid demographic decline. I'm sorry, there's a slide missing. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> brutal decline, brutal. From hundreds of thousands to a few tens of thousands and the fear of total disappearance. Um, politicians elaborated on the matter of population replacement. They called it repopulation and brought in discussions on the appropriate races, quoting, and ended up making an alliance with the planters for the purpose, or plantation owners, for the purpose of bringing in laborers from abroad. Many possibilities were considered, Pacific Islanders, Chinese, Japanese, Malays, Indians, Europeans. This document by historians of labor and of plantation, Takaki, Biher, Moon. A diversified workforce might be a docile workforce kept divided in ethnic, national and racialized enclaves and separate work gangs that were supervised by someone closer to the holy class. So Hawaii entered the 20th century with a multi-ethnic society with its own racial arrangements along an idiosyncratic social stratification. The black and white vocabulary of the mainland US was inadequate for the local complexity which had evolved in its own way. Hawaii's potential as a laboratory for social studies was explored early on by pioneering sociologists from the Chicago School, Romezo Adams and Andrew Lind. They came in the 1920s to the newly founded University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, and founded the sociology department. They promoted hands-on empirical research with their students and brought in Robert Park as visiting scholar in 31. They collected a large amount of data on the accommodation of different groups using the concepts of amalgamation and assimilation. They used the available categories, they used the available categories uh, shaped by social use and endorsed by the censuses adopted since the mid 19th century. The censuses sanitized the slur of m or mere vulgarity attached to the popular categories which were Kanakas, Hofkes, Holes, Pakis, Portuguese, and they used instead Hawaiians, part Hawaiians, whites, Chinese, Portuguese, and so on. But those the former categories were still in use in society forever until now. Uh, up to the 1930s, those were the distinctions in the uh, census. They were official. Portuguese were separate from white and they were described as Caucasian, but not white. It meant that they had a mobile color because they could be used for uh, supporting the plantation owners uh, g by granting them uh, vote rights, but they were excluded from the uh, white circles uh, uh, of the white planters. Okay, Romanzo Adams and colleagues contested the use of race, even though his book was interracial marriage in a way, uh, they contested the use of race to refer to the social groups and argued that there was nothing biological 
the so solely social in their distinctiveness and proposed the more accommodating concept of ancestry as a mode to overcome the tension between biological and social criteria for collective identities. Yet, he presented the groups in ways that so resounded of the physical anthropologists' approaches to races, particularly when they resorted to photographs of types in order to illustrate the book, that they reinforced the very thing they wanted to dismiss, that is, the stereotyping of groups on the basis of their physical appearances and somatics. And with that came also the local produced hierarchy of colors. Uh, Richard Drayton this morning uh, dis has discussed and suggested uh, hierarchogenesis uh, as a way of describing this. And this is where, uh, where uh, the Caucasian but not white uh, uh, label uh, appears to the Portuguese, which, which went there in tens of thousands, 20,000 in between 1878 and uh, uh, 1913. That's something I will be happy to answer in Korean ways because uh, that's what I have my hands on. As a concluding note, oh, forgot to show this, like they traveled all the way from uh, Madeira and the Azores to the Hawaii archipelago. It could take up to six months. It was very expensive to the uh, plantation owners and government to sponsor them, but uh, they considered one target group to repopulate Hawaii for some time. Then they changed their mind, then they uh, took that again. In the end, a big community was grown uh, there um, with uh, an heritage that they celebrate along with other groups by volunteering to create this celebration of diversity but also acknowledging what goes on in uh, stratification terms. Okay, so like, no. Okay, this is the sort of celebration. Concluding note. A wise process of racialization of labor is an example of a wider process affecting most plantation and plantation-like societies that is the rationale behind the project The Color of Labor. Once people move across political boundaries as labor, they are reframed in categories that go with the production system. Those categories are not merely a function of a productive logic or production logic. They also enact imagined hierarchies that are translated into the naturalized categories of color and race. Race may at times equate to nation, nationalities, cultures, and other assumed qualities of the laborers. Irish, Chinese, whatever. But above all, it exists as a function of a hierarchy of labor. Who is meant to do what? Who gets dehumanized by the function? Who gets rehumanized when some other group comes in for the lowly function? This is a dynamic hierarchization that changes with time, but it survives and persists as a naturalized separation of groups that are ascribed with features, qualities, colors. Laborers become colorized in black, brown, yellow, red, and other forms of non-white, while white is kept aside for owners and supervisors. Although neither all owners and supervisors are white, nor all whites are owners and supervisors. Color is a sign that packs a number of attributes, those attributes being themselves mobile and their order being dynamic. How those signs become naturalized, disputes, question, ascribed is a prime ground for ethnographic and archival research. That is a challenge in this project. And it is on purpose that we do not address the two largest displacements of labor known to history, the massive enslavement of Africans to the plantations in the Americas and Caribbean, the one that created the Negro category out of the assorted displaced Africans and the one at the root of modern racism, and second, the massive displacement of South Asians as indentured laborers in the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, Fiji, the British domains in Africa and the Gulf. There are vast bodies of literature about each of these major displacements and related diasporas. Learning from those literatures combined 
I address other cases of labor related non whiteness in the plantation, post plantation, and plantation like world. With the help of a great team, great advisors, and greatest audience, may I aim at the production of some anthropological knowledge on the co production of mobility, labor, and racializations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christiana. This is not only reminding us how coloniality of power is engraved in different forms and regimes of labor, but also how those categories and mobility, labor, and race and racializations are co-produced. And uh, thank you very much. We are now moving to uh, uh, our next speaker is Bella Feldman Bianco. Uh, Bella is a professor emeritus of social anthropology at the Campinas State University, Unicamp in Brazil. She's the founding member of the Center for the Study of International Migration at Unicamp. And her research focuses on culture and power in relation to identity, migration, and displacement, and colonialism and post-colonialism in a comparative perspective. And currently, uh, Feldman Bianco Bella serves as a coordinator of the Brazilian Anthropological Association's Committee on Migration and Displacement, and as a counselor at the Ministry of Labor's National Council on uh, immigration. Her most recent work concentrates on the varieties of displacement in terms of scales and space as integral to the production of inequality in global capitalism. So I think that uh, as I start, uh, as I started in the beginning, that when we were planning this uh, plenary, we were trying to open up the concept of the mobility, not only to different perspective, perspective per, uh, different perspectives from uh, different positionalities, but also mobility of capital, mobility of information, not only mobility of uh, people which were entangled with those mobilities and especially in the context of also capitalism. So I give the floor to uh, Bella Feldman Bianco. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with Aisha, Nina, Christiana, and I really thank for the invitation. And this is my first uh, IASA meeting also. So I am very pleased to be here. Well, in this presentation, I argue for a global perspective on displacement in the current global conjuncture of capital accumulation, whether considering transnational migration, political and environment refugee seekers, human trafficking, the removal of populations or territories due to real state interests or large development projects, or assassinations and militarizations in urban peripheries. In a scenario marked by a destructive corporate capitalism, these varieties of displacement bring to the fore new logics of social exclusion, which is producing contingents of the dispossessed. The current intersection of policies and practices of criminalization, securitization, militarization, and monetarism involving a multiplicity of state and international actors and diverse social sub subjects has made more complex the debate and analysis about the production of new stratifications, hierarchies, and violence as different scales and according to varied temporalities and spatialities. Why Sassen's notion of expulsions and Harvey's accumulation by dispossession concept are valuable tools for the understanding of the movements of capital, the displacement paradigm aims at uncovering the interstices of domination and power and the production of inequalities inherent to the structure of global political economy. The idea is to investigate how mobilities and immobilities of many times and scales reflect the production of domination, dispossession, and violence in everyday life, as well as the subjectivities and social mobilizations of different protagonists against this type of violence and domination. In the second part, I will 
we use some ethnography, but now endure, please. <laughs> Against this background, we have to take into account that while the movements of capital, science and virtual communications seem to dissolve borders, certain flows of people, products and places have been the focus of restrictive policies and selective control. Thus, issues related to transnational migrants, refugees and asylum seekers have become central to the agendas of national governments, multilateral agencies and international organizations. In the same manner, internal, internal displacement resulting from the elimination of territories or people at the margin have been at the heart of both local and national policies, issuing global multilater multilateral agendas. It is therefore crucial to discern the implication between these contemporary political processes and the different types, scales and spaces of displacements as part of the same social processes. This implies considering migrations, migration policies and the social agency of migrants, refugees and other displaced peoples, such as indigenous populations, squatters, families of assassinated or incarcerated children, in a global scenario marked by flexible capital and labor, outsourcing, privatization, financialization, technocratic governance, state redistribution and state violence. This conceptual tool allows discerning mobility and immobilities and the production of inequality as part of the dynamic formation of capital, which is simultaneously global, national, and specifically local. This perspective necessarily demands global ethno-historical analysis capable of revealing social continuities and ruptures. Why human mobility is millenary, ever since the 15th century, the movement of people around the world has been part of capital formation and thus emerged with gender racialization of subaltern people, colonialist capitalist expansion, and corollary, corollary st structures of domination and inequality. In this sense, it is helpful to consider Kihano's coloniality of power construct, which is grounded on the imposition of, of a racial and ethnic classification of the world's population, affecting the material and subjective facets of social existence. According to him, both the coloniality of power and coloniality of knowledge express the con colonial, colonial continuities, including unequal relations at different scales that then out to be more enduring than colonialism itself as a form of domination. From this sense, a global perspective on displacements further requires theorizing the intersectionalities of race, racism, racialization, gender, as these perspectives concern a diverse set of subaltern actors that tend to be studied separately. Conversely, there are immigrants and refugees who are Africans, Afro-descendants, or indigenous people, and urban squatters. Considering the social agency of these multiple protagonists, it's imperative to examine their actions, reactions, inactions, strategies, and social mobilizations regarding the prevailing ambiguities between differential access and exclusion to human and citizen rights. Consequently, this approach demands an investigation of the intrinsic relationship among the agency of migrants and refugees and other displaced people and displacements, inequality, securitization, militarization, national refiguration, structural and state violence, and dispossession through times and places. It's for the call for examination of how categories are formulated and set in motion, when and by whom, as well as their differential meanings in specific contexts within the realm of power relations. From this viewpoint, this broader notion of displacement has the condition to lay the comparative basis for a better comprehension of new and old logics of social exclusion produced by contemporary capitalism. This displacement paradigm as a ga gateway towards understanding and exposing social continuities and ruptures goes beyond the prevailing positivism that divides knowledge into different fields of study and tends to verify the nation state. Attempts against positivist fragmentation bring to the fore the endurance of the coloniality of knowledge, which includes also language we need to publish in speak in English. In a way, these attempts are an outcome of my experiences conducting a long-term comparative ethno-historical research on transnational migration that reveals the complexity underlying social processes. Certainly, anthropology 
as praxis opens new horizons in this way, allowing theoretical and methodological assessments to be continually subjected to critical dialogues, reassessments, and refinements. However, since the questions we ask are also guided by our, our, our worldviews and intellectual artisanship in the right view sense, knowledge production is never neutral. It's not by chance that growing up in Brazil during the Cold War, I became interested in issues related to power relations and social inequalities, and thus in ethnographies of capitalism, or better, in ethnographies deconstructing capitalism. And it's from this positioning that, in, that during my term a few years ago, as president of the Association of Brazilian Anthropology, ABBA, where we combine academic scholarship and social action is that instead of being just exposed to an intensive force on indigenous ethnology, as was suggested to me that I was going to undergo by my dear friend Roque Laraia, the emeritus president of ABBA, I became aware through the displacement, dispossessions, the violence confronted by the indigenous, indigenous and other subaltern people, not different from what I have watched and followed in my res research on transnational migration of the need of understanding and conceptualizing the varieties, scales, and spaces of mobility and the restrictions and limitations to these mobilities in the present conjunct of capitalism and also in the past. Towards this end, I began to organize a series of international symposiums also with colleagues in Portuguese or English, and sometimes Portuguese and Spanish, reuniting scholars whose historical or contemporary re research focus, focusing on different types, scales, and spaces of displacements in different parts of the world. Here I make use of works from South America, and particularly Brazil, which were first presented in seminars I organized, in which, in which are already published in Portuguese. Uh, but, uh, but not, but to give you an idea of some production on, on displacement from this point of view. Uh, of course, they have patterns that are not restricted to Brazil or South America instead, but it's a way to use this uh, data. data. So I had to cut a lot, but current ever increasing draconian migration and border control in force in the European Union and the United States tend to attract more attention from the media and researchers rather than what is happening in South America, particularly in this Trump's era. But uh, there is a relation what hap is happening here and in South America. And from the South American point of view, Dominer examined historically the recurrent formulation in South American continent of dichotomous categories to distinguish between immigrants considered desirable and indesirable, as well as the continuous centrality of entry prohibitions and expulsions in the social construction of migrants as illegal subjects. In the 19th century, in the context of nation-state formation, is a prevailing Europe Eurocentric, eugenic, and hygienist ideologies, immigration aims policies aimed predominantly at the vitamin, vitamin of the South Am American nations by recruiting certain European immigrants viewed as agents of civilization in progress. This is coloniality of uh, power in action. Among those classified as undesirable were not only the black, but also the yellow Chinese, the physical and mental patients, the subversives, notably the anarchists, the delinquents, the marginal and transgressors of legal and moral laws, such as prostitutes and prostitution, or, or narcotic traffickers. Despite eventual changes in legislation, these policies based upon na national security perpetuated and intensified throughout the 20th century. In this 21st century, together with regionalization of migratory policies linked to the constitution of a global regime of migration control, technocratic regulatory policies have engendered new forms for organizing and classific classifying migratory migratory flows also adopted by Latin American nations. The old categories and classifications of the undesirables subsume under the new threats established by the internal community, such as drug trafficking, terrorism, human trafficking, and documented migration. Consider considering these transformations, 
Dominaire argues that the migratory policy of the past relating the deportation and anarchist rested on a hegemonic construction of anarchist immigrants as dangerous subjects whose ideology defied the nation state and thus legitimated use of state violence. In comparison, today's deportation has become a substantive part of a regime of migration control that articulates and does not separate securitization and an insufficient humanitarianism which treats migrants and refugees as passive victims. Thus, different forms of expulsion have become part of strategies com to combat the new and undesirables. Precisely those immigrants considered by the tec technocratic dogma potential threats who do not, uh, not even offer advantages for the economic order and that are therefore disposable. This agenda of securitization and militarization overlaps and broadens Brazil's insertion and also of other South American countries in the global battle against drug trafficking, human trafficking, and terrorism, as well as giving South America turned to the right, the reconfiguration of a new geopolitics in the continent, especially with reference to Venezuela. It is therefore necessary to consider the impact of these institutional changes on the mobility and immobility of migrants, refugees and other displaced peer persons in the context of prevailing tensions between protecting people and protecting borders, which marks global migration regime regimes, even the compact, global compact on migration. In this regard, the Palermo Protocol, which is the main global instrument directed at combating human trafficking and protecting the victims' fundamental rights, is a case in point. In a comparative study between Rio de Janeiro and Barcelona, published in 2015, Pichitelli and Lohenkraut argue that despite the significant differences in the way this protocol was implemented in each country, those considered victims of trafficking tended to be similarly and simultaneously categorized as both victims and undocumented migrants and thus subjected to detention and deportation. However, as Pichitelli later contended, even so, anti-trafficking regimes, processes of global expansion continue to use a rhetoric of protection, maintaining repression and violence against some times of displacement. The articulation between the criminalization of migration and the anti-trafficking regimes underwent processes of differentiation and change in both countries at different times. According to her, in the Spanish case, Ever since 2008-2009 crisis and the resulting decrease in immigration, the simultaneous control of both prostitution and undocumented migration, leading to the deportation of undocumented prostitutes, was replaced by violent police repression against prostitution. Yet in the Brazilian case, the concern with border controls in a scenario marked by the diffusion of human trafficking notion became increasingly relevant after the arrival of new immigrants, especially those coming from rural south, such as Asia. At the same time that it was set in motion, uh, to stigmatize immigrants in border regions, the anti-trafficking language concerning commercial sex and prostitution repression was appropriated, implement, implemented, incorporated by moral standpoint in various local agendas. Moreover, while the enactment of a new trafficking law in Brazil in 2016 offering greater protection to the victims of trafficking, thinking, overlap with President Rousseff impeachment, new securitization actions taken by the current federal government have been reinforced by supranational instances. The pressure exercised by these global policies, uh, including the launching of a 2017 global action to prevent and combat human trafficking and smuggling of immigrants have sustained the dissemination of actions restricting mobilities with particular cruelty in the case of sexualized, racialized and stigmatized persons, such as sex workers, especially women and transvestites. On the other hand, global policies of securitization and criminalization of Brazilian borders, aiming at preventing and repressing international piracy, ultimately published punish and stigmatize local populations. Using data of a 2016 public security at the border report, Hirata 
or better, IRATA, examined issues related to public security and militarism in Brazil, Brazil's northern region against the background of an ongoing hybridization between settlement policies, development policies, and urban policies against drug trafficking. By way of a historical analysis of this region, characterized by successive large development projects invariably abandoned, he discerns the replacement since the end of the 1990s of a prevailing bipolar <coughs> logic centered on wars between nations by a global war against drugs, transnational organized crime, human trafficking, and terrorism that threaten urban spaces. According to him, the current interlink of security policies against internal opponents in national defense policies against external enemies which aims at protecting border and counteracting the so-called border illegalities that supply the drug markets in large cities have found resonance in local history. Thus, present-day global policies have enforced the region's historical settlement pattern through the establishment of military bases and the centrality of militarism. Yet, in the eagerness, oh, thank you, Yet, in the eagerness to follow the global agenda and format the, to combat drug trafficking, human trafficking, and smuggling, the state's activity in the region shifted from a development project which began in 2004 and only touched on public security towards a public, uh, a public security project aimed at a counteracting the circulation of the so-called illicit goods. Thus, the security project, dangerous drawing up on issue rela issues related to regional development, has the potential <coughs> to enter in for conflict with the local economy and exchange system. In addition to local and transnational trade and the commerce of legal and illegal goods, just right after the 2010 80s earthquake, large flows of Asians and to a lesser extent, Senegalese began crossing the borders of the Amazon and the Acre states. More recently, the different segments of the Venezuelan population, including indigenous people who do not have a Western conception of frontier, who do not intend to settle in Brazil, have arrived mainly via Roraima. Despite initial detentions, these migrants tended to be able to cross Brazilian borders, since rather than denying entrance, the pattern was to control, register, regularize, and issue visas to those entering, attempting to enter the country. So control was important. In the case of Haitians, a normative resolution by na the National Immigration Council has allowed the management of an alleged crisis by granting humanitarian visas in Port-au-Prince through a partnership with IOM and agreements with other South American countries. By this way, governmental officers prevented migrants to land crossing Brazilian borders without papers. Comparatively, the alleged Venezuelan crisis was was really became a mother of a milit militarization of the immigrants, immigrant issues. And right now, furthermore, more in, in view of the increasing flows of Venezuelan migrants arriving in the states and the competition between federal, state, and local levels, the Roraima governor attempted to close the doors to, to Venezuelan migrants, which has resulted in an ongoing judicial debate ba ba battle uh, between different groups of people, of course, including those social movements favoring uh, the immigrants' rights. The federal government actions in Roraima also intersect with a military intervention in Rio de Janeiro. While in the case of the Brazilian North, as we have seen, militarization has historically focused on the protection of territorial borders, in Rio de Janeiro, militarized urban experiences, such as the pacifying police units, concentrated on the favelas or shanty towns of the city. Portrayed until the 1970s as a working class territory, shanty towns and urban peri peripheries of Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo came to be viewed as lots of crime and drug trafficking by global exporting policies. State violence against the urban peripheries dwellers centers 
on selective criminalization and racialization. The state's policies, which include pacification, incarceration, and even extermination, bring to light the logic of exclusion <coughs> underlying contemporary corporate capitalism, which discards masses of the dispossessed. The military intervention decreed by Brazil's federal government, combining the authoritarian tradition of the Brazilian elite with the current global policies, follows the same securitization logic. Considering that pacification as a social construction has been used since colonial times, mostly in, rela in relation to the indigenous population, Pacheco de Oliveira focused on this category to compare distinct modalities of the tutelary governance of territories and populations put in practice by governmental offices concerning both the indigenous populations and the shanty towns and peripheries dwellers in different moments of Brazilian history. His analysis points to social continuities or in Quirano's terms to enduring colonialism of power. In the past, the governance and control of the autochthony populations was fixed by force, repression, and religious conversions, thus enabling okay, uh, the participation. The, oh, now I am lost. Uh, in the past, the past governance, uh, uh, the governance and control of the autochthony the populations was fierce by force, repression and religious conversion, thus enabling their participation in the colonizing society as Christians and faithful subjects of the king of Portugal. Later, the pacification category was described by indigenous protection service as a humanitarian process called by the state to protect a highly vulnerable and disadvantaged population now contacted without violence. At the same time, these pacifications, besides producing a resist labor force, were fundamental to insulate the Indians in small tracts of land, simultaneously liberating vast spaces to be appropriated by private interests, leading to increasing value of land in, in all the region, which is, in which is operated. Comparatively, the aim of the present pacification is to restore military control over the shanty towns occupied by traffic. Executive of security policies perceive these territories as enemy spaces and these inhabitants as collaborators in relation to their own evil, evil with a permissiveness of more than sufficient that, that does not distinguish them from organized crime. Far from being enforcers of law, the policemen in the process of pa pacification boasts a moral superiority of an unlimited capacity for punishment that makes him imagine himself as a true evasion angel. Moreover, there are, there are like uh, comparisons here, the continuities in, in, in terms of the pacification of the Indians and what is going on on the Shanty Tons. Uh, and also, this cleansing of territories has increased land market values. Also, uh, Sanjujo and Feltran critically reflected on the relations between politics and violence based on a dialogue between two investigations that deal with situations that, despite their diverse spatiality and temporality, have in common the fact that state agents have caused the death of internal enemies. One focuses attention on forced disappearances and political assassinations during the last Argentine dictatorship and the production of political subversion in the ten disappear categories. Comparatively, the other examines the disappearances of and assassinations of young people in the urban peripheries of Sao Paulo. In the, uh, in the Argentinian case, still during the Cold War, opponents of the territorial regime were recognized by the na national com community as political actors. Their forced disappearances became a national and international political matter, while the movements of relatives denouncing the violence inflicted on their detained disappeared persons obtained public legitimacy. From the memory of the dictatorship, experienced by memories of injustice and pain, marked by the criminalization, extermination, and disappearance of political opponents, a collective public legitimized, uh, public, uh, publicly legitimized mourning arose. In contrast, in the Brazilian case, state violence directed against shanty town and urban peripheries dwellers centers on a selective 
criminalization marked by social cleavages and in an apparent paradox, measures of police control in São Paulo are produced by the world of crime. In this context, why Argentina's family movements highlight the political identity of the disappeared detainees, Brazil's similar mobilization emphasize racial, class, and territor territorial crit criteria used by repression while striving to prove that they are victims of violence were honest and unrelated people. By criminalizing and racializing shanty towns and periphery dwellers, and then pacifying, capturing, or even exterminating them, current policies bring to light the underlying logic of exclusion and in contemporary corporate capitalists that discard masses of this process who, not, who do not even have the rights to be entitled human. As I try to show through these ethnographies, the adoption of a global perspective of this displacement makes it possible to expose the intricacies of power and domination in the production of inequalities, expulsion and dispossession in this conjuncture of local capitalists. They bring to light similar patterns in the restriction and control of the displacements of the diverse protagonists, be they undocumented immigrants, especially in the case of sex workers, and refugee seekers, or shanty and urban periphery dwellers. This case is also bring to light the enduring colonial of power and increasing securitization, militarization, and exploitation. While there is an intrinsic relationship between capital formation, structure of nomination, racialization, and social inequality since the colonial times, reinforced by the enduring colonial of power, like the case of pacification shows, it is worth noting that during the Cold War, the enemies of the state, subjected to state violence, were those who ideologically fought to the established political system. Not surprisingly, as the case study of the detained de disappeared of the Argentina dictatorial regimes indicates with the redemocratization of the country, these political opponents and the social mov movements of their families acquired national and international public legitimacy and became symbols of the struggle for human rights. In contrast, today's internal and external enemies characterized as common criminals and subjected to detention, deportation, death at the territorial borders, murders, are those expelled from the social and economic order who form the mass of disposable people who are not even considered human by contemporary corporate capitalists. It is worthwhile mentioning that in the context of this increasing civilization, there has been also social solidarity to use as a them, which is also part of the displacement paradigm, and has been the formation of global movements reuniting the Argentinian families movements with the Brazilian family movements and the Black Mother movements. But this is really for another paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bella, for, uh, for this talk and then, among others, highlighting how different narratives circulate and uh, become entangled, like the certain narratives like anti-trafficking. They circulate and become entangled in uh, the criminalization, pacification, and the governance of very different segments of uh, population, and then the also, in an ironic way, the productivity of state violence in creating solidarities for uh, different groups of uh, people. But now, I would like to, we have a few minutes for questions. I would like to give the floor to uh, our, one of our co-conveners, Sarah Green, to moderate the questions. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank uh, the, the speakers very much indeed for a very stimulating set of thoughts. And also for those of you who've managed to uh, stay through, it's been a long day, I know. Uh, I think all these three uh, papers have some fascinating and very important interventions to make into the theme of the conference uh, with, with just to remind you so as you can be preparing your questions, Nina's uh, circulating around the question of crisis and, and how that gets constituted and this question of, of the missing and who has the right 
to care and who not. Uh, it's interesting intervention with regard to, for instance, Didier Fassin's distinction between humanitarianism and human rights and whether the move towards humanitarianism takes the political sting out of the question uh, and, and, the, and this kind of Antigone type battle between, on the missing between the, 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 the law of the king and the law of the father. All three papers, I think, had something to say about uh, t the relationship between kind of uh, techniques, technologies, uh, laws, ideologies, uh, and, and mobilities. So, you know, as Haraway implied many years ago in the 1980s in her discussion of cyborgs, there are non-innocent non technologies can sometimes be used to establish resistance as well as uh, collaboration. But this set of papers, which looks at the interface between materialities, technologies, techniques, laws, economical systems, and people's bodies, I think is a very, very important intervention in the question of mobilities. And so just to, that was just a kind of summary to remind you of some of the things you've heard from the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm opening the floor to questions and I think there's a roaming mic around. Uh, state your name just so people know who you are. My name's Ida Sosa, I'm from CUNY and I really loved this panel, it was great, all of you. And thank you for organizing it. This is a question because nobody asked. Um, I think it was brilliant the way you were addressing the questions of race and labor and the, con the sort of constraints of what's defined as, as missing and not missing and disappearance, the three of them. What I'm asking really is, we used to have these grand categories and, and I know Christiana kind of threw them out and brought them back, but we used to say imperialism, uh, or capitalism and processes, each of you broke these things up, not that you threw the categories out, but you didn't um, pull them back together. You kind of gave us all the different ways in which they're rippling in all the different places, but you didn't say the words which sometimes, and I think it's a little dogmatic, but, you know, um, U.S. imperialism or... Uh, what is the EU doing that causes these problems or the history of Portuguese imperialism? I didn't hear those kind of uh, overall picture because you were pulling apart and showing all the different processes. I wondered if you'd like to, if you're interested even in, in re-putting it back together. Anybody would like to start answering? Well, I don't know if I see it as uh, necessarily uh, that we didn't pick up or th that we didn't bring together. I mean, my, my, my interest in, in my intervention was not so much to, to show the workings of European or North American border policies as to talk about which concepts and categories can produce new insights instead of just going with the categories, whether mingling them in new ways, not taking them for granted, using, say, the categories that people we work with, speak with, encounter in the field or in detention centers, or, I mean, I took a lot of, of, of my interviews uh, in, in the airport of Guatemala City, where I was allowed to sit when the detention plane, uh, planes uh, came down and people are held for four or five hours questions, so they had nothing better to do than to talk to me. And these very notions that, that both uh, the Guatemalan authorities and large part of the whole humanitarian uh, apparatus that are present in, in, in the airport have, I mean, it becomes so obvious that that way of looking at it doesn't work. I mean, I am sitting there with a little uh, juice and you can have medical attention and everybody knows that 98% of those going through that airport is on a bus northwards, uh, 
tomorrow again, right? So these whole processes of illegalizing that, while that's the only option for some people, because otherwise they will be killed. Can you imagine having taken loans to travel without being able to pay them back and living in, 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 in those very uh, violent um, countries? That's, that's not possible. So to me, it's not so much a, qu a question of blaming somebody or saying this is because, but more saying how can I or we as a scholarly community better understand what is going on instead of just taking for granted these uh, meta-narratives that we get from, from um, uh, public policy makers and large international organizations, be that on trafficking or on, on uh, illegalized uh, human migration. Well, thanks for allowing me extra time to make my point. Uh, I would not uh, aim at uh, wrapping it back to one imperialism or one imperial uh, entity. It's precisely the opposite. What I'm uh, trying to do is to run away or move away from empire-centered histories and approaches to societies that are bounded in a national-centered history and then creates the illusion of ethnicities, multiculturalism, uh, whatever, which is what is narrated after nations, and look instead at crossings of what were distinct political units. And the only way of doing it is to follow the people against the narrative of empires and nations. So when I, that's why it took me a very long time to put together this project, because it didn't make any sense. It didn't appear in the sources. It didn't appear in the analytical sources at all. These were invisible people. Now, if I tell you, why does my uh, uh, Portuguese colleague get blown away when I say there were far more people within Portuguese national, born, born in Portuguese territory, living in Guyana and in Hawaii than there were in Angola and Mozambique, which is the empire story, in 1900, they don't believe it. Historians, we, you know, professors of history and everything, but I have the data. So why do I have the data and you know, nobody else? Because it's invisible if you go through imperial histories. So what I'm trying, maybe I'll go get back to some entity, but what I'm doing now is running away from that and looking at the mobilities of the actual people, the people that sponsor them, the forces that shape them together. When you were saying, it missed the word I said, Oh, it's missed the word capitalism. I was thinking all morning, why didn't I use capitalism <laughs> through? And you know, it's, also, it's capitalism and other formations that are either pre-capitalism proper and post-capitalist uh, proper that I want to address in this uh, formation. So I think labor, it's the other side of capital, but it's more than that because it exists in, or at least what goes on with labor. And the process of racialization go even further if we move away from the, as you said, meta-narrative of you know, capitalist exploration and nation and uh, empire and so on. But I don't have the full theoretical picture yet. I, I don't think so. Okay, thanks. Hello, it's my turn. I, uh, I could use imperialism. <laughs> but the fact, what I was trying to do, uh, yes, I think, I could do build. Uh, I could use it, deconstruct the imperialism. But what I was trying to do is here to show that we have to have uh, like how the uh, the food of uh, not, uh, we study migration and other things are happening that are exactly of offering the same patterns. This is why. I use, in fact, the construction of capitalism, and I could add imperialism. But I really, my point was to show that we cannot just, we, we lose the overall vis vision when we look at only at migrants or only at squatters, when this is happening all around. And also, imperialism is also in terms of the global policies that are now being exported. And I think that's important, in fact, to study the role of the, uh, the multilateral agencies and the international organizations that are building 
and supporting these policies, and it's really frightening. It's imperialism. Thank you very much. We have a couple more questions now just on that issue. What I found fascinating in regard to Ida's question about this panel is the panel was really focusing on how subjects become objects and then get classified in a variety of ways. And so rather than studying the subjectivities of people, it's studying the objectification of people and how those, those processes have particular histories and ideologies. And I think that's very, very useful. Uh, there's a question over here. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the panel, and I, but I wanted to pr particularly pick up the point about labor um, and looking at um, what uh, similarities as opposed to difference and as opposed to the la labels and different social formations and not getting caught up in the shifting a meaning of the of the labels and the categories but rather looking at the facts and that's what I found so useful about um, your approach and the use of laborers and labor because and I think that that is particularly relevant today as we see in the, you know, the kind of global uh, global economy uh, that is challenging everyone actually who are laborers and who are owners of labor who has resources and who are without resources and there I think that there are many more things that uh, we have in common than than that divide us and that perspective the way that you uh, uh, use labor in that way is very inspiring because I think we need to do that more often and that's and, and it makes anthropology relevant continuously so that is Oh, sorry, my name is Michelle Tisdall. Uh, I'm a social anthropologist. Obviously, I work at the National Library of Norway, but as a researcher, I've researched um, heritage production in Cuba, uh, in museums and heritage. But um, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much to all of you, but I wanted to particularly uh, pick up the focus on labor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pick up, because we've only got about five more minutes left. I'll pick up any more comments that anybody wants to make, and then allow the floor to make some final statements. Anybody else want to add, impose? Yeah. Oh, Aisha, yeah, carry on. <laughs> if I may. Yes, of course. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for these all these three talks, and I find some uh, I find very striking similarities in a way that the, uh, the way that you present it, and I'm I find the quest the concept of trespassing conceptually and then the conceptual trespassing and then trespassing in various meanings. I find it very fertile uh, concept and in a way that looking at the questions of mobility and migration uh, from uh, Latin America, from different parts of the world that you were looking at, in a way you were showing us uh, and urging us to study migration uh, mobilities and the kind of the um, cross-fertilization with different groups of people that it brought together different groups of people in terms of the solidarities, in terms of the disappeared disappearances and that kind of the war victims and then the uh, migrants or in uh, Bella's case, the uh, people in the shanty towns, migrants and indigenous uh, uh, populations. So uh, it brought those groups together in terms of criminalized, in terms of the, uh, uh, but also mobilized uh, these people. And I'm wondering uh, whether it's a question to all of you, whether you see um, these kind of things in relation to, do you think that why this, you were able to see these kind of uh, cross fertilizations, I would say, in code, in code unquote, uh, because it was only happening in that region that you were working on, or because of the conceptual frame that you had. So if you look at it in terms of, because in Europe, or if you are seeing it in Europe, whether you see those kinds of entanglements taking place, or 
not in terms of because this is the shanty town people and then they're putting together they're put together they're criminalized in a particular way but the kind of the movement solidarity movements that in argentina or in in brazil that you see that these people these movements come together so do you, in europe whether or not we have or we don't see because of the particular concepts and understandings that we operate with. Okay, uh, each one of you has got a, uh, a minute and a half and then we're done. <laughs> Do you want to respond? We go oh, back? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I think this is really my main question under, uh, under this, the displacement is, when is it that mo social mobi uh, different social mobilizations can get together? And I think that, you know, I cannot talk about Europe so much, but no, I can, about Portugal, no, about Lisbon, not Portugal, Lisbon, about New Bedford, you know, specific local places. I think that you al always have social mobilizations. You have, uh, in, 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 in Lisbon, there was a very strong social mobilization of uh, middle uh, le leadership of uh, migrant immigrants uh, uh, leadership not only and you have to look also the, at the transnational uh, perspective not only in terms of the fight in Europe but also in terms of getting uh, rights in Brazil for instance uh, in your best but you have also this mobilization uh, not only by the migrants, but also by different, uh, different sectors of the population against wha what's going on. I, I, and uh, like in terms of Brazil that I'm following more, I think that there are really mo moments of mobilization, that you have social mobilizations, but People putting together, people uh, from the town, uh, the town shanties, uh, shanty towns, from uh, immigrants mov movements, and so on. But through music, for instance, through raps, you know, there are moments. In, and my question is exactly this: When is it that we can find now in this conjuncture, uh, at, at least, at least? at the local level, when people can get united together to mobilize against the, the status quo. And I think that there are moments that this, this can happen. I don't know if I, I am making sense. I am really, uh, if, if I answer your question. It, to me, but you this are, is really we, have my to, question. we have to carry on, give the other two a chance just to speak for a minute, because we have literally two minutes left for the session. Um, you will, uh, it's, a, it's a great question for all anthropologists anywhere, uh, everywhere, all times. In this particular case, why do I, do, did I see, did I have the right tools? Was it a specific? I think my, in my case it's a little bit different because I actively searched after being puzzled with not being able to figure out or having the conceptual tools to describe to describe uh, something that I so I could see it uh, when going back to it was what was presented as a colonial settlement of the 19th century that for me it was really more like a migrant migration after looking at what I could see from the documents or what had been the experience of people so that led me to look at something that was completely, completely invisible, which was the mass migration of immense number of people of what is now being addressed by the literature. There are now books on migration within empire uh, showing uh, that particular case, there was the paradox of being an uh, imperial pot, uh, power, but mostly a migrant uh, uh, exodus. So the context I'm looking for now, they are more prone to go to the last consequences of this issue of crossing over empires, going through 
Doc, now I know to you know where to get them. Not in the books, not in the mainstream stuff, but in the consular complaints, in the some weird primary sources. And then it becomes like, wow, why could we not see this before? Because it's so massive. And I risked getting some uh, fields, because it's a big project with a lot of people, where it's not clear where you're going to have this. Uh, it's like a scientific experience. You can confirm it or not confirm it. It's an exploration. But I don't know if I answer to that conceptual part. That's how I went about it. Thank you. That sounds hopeful. And your, the last word, Nina. Very short. I mean, the very picture of trespassing is this barbed wire with these little metal things that scratches surfaces. It hurts, you know, and you get small little wounds that uh, heal uh, very uh, differently. And I think exactly this is going on. I mean, this is not my project. I do research together with, with, with other researchers, but also together with with migrants of, 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 of different nationalities. I also work in Europe. And what I can see in terms of, of cross-fertilization of different groups, of different people, is perhaps how, I mean, a lot of the people I work with these days are PhD students, of uh, Latin American PhD students whose mothers were scrubbing floors in Madrid uh, or, 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 or Italy, who are now engaged in looking on these processes that were seen as uh, more or less seamless, transnational, by other generations and stuff. So I think this cross-fertilization of different, uh, uh, between different groups of people, between Latin Americans who were also very active in the movement of uh, Los Indignados in, in, in Spain as a political force, that that kind of, of collaborations perhaps can bring new insights. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? To try to understand better what's going on. Thank you. We're completely out of time. I have to say, I, despite all the disturbing things I heard here, it also sounded to me that there's hope because you're going all these, through these kind of practical, material, technical, ideological, as well as scientific conditions that permit, force, prohibit, and perhaps most of all, attempt to control the circumstances of mobilities. It means it's created by people and they're fallible, his, historically variable machines and machinations. And it could be otherwise, and that's hopeful. And on that note, we'll end. Thank you for all who stayed to the end. Thank you.